Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobia Singers. Let's get biblical Q&A coming to you from the Holy Land, Rabbi Tobia, the man singer. Welcome back, Rabbi. How are you? It'd be helpful if I unmuted your microphone, though, I think. <laughs> yeah. I think one time All I actually right. had it. I think one time I had you. I hear myself. Okay. In my earphones. Okay. Uh, and now I don't. Now good. we're good. Whatever you did good, now. Good, good, good. Good. I think maybe it was Satan good. echoing in here. <laughs> it's all right. In about seven years, we'll get it. It'll all be locked up, and that'll be the end, and Mashiach will be here, and we won't need the show anymore. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's funny. Wow. It's good to, good to see you, Rabbi. Uh, so you've had a good week, I hope. Yeah, yeah, it's been amazing. Been a what terrific week. So, what was and life for you uh, like? Because I mean, you were on a really huge tour, uh, in my opinion. There was a really huge travel plans and stuff that you had so many places to go. I mean, how did you yeah. how did you um, manage getting back to normal? It wasn't easy, you know. It was a, a large tour, and because of COVID and lockdowns and so on, I. Public speaking essentially had come to an end until I mean, two months ago, a month and a half ago. Right. Well, we, going to the United States is not difficult for some reason. When you're traveling west, it's okay. It's okay. But when you return back east, you really get slammed. You're really out of it. It takes like a week to 10 days to just gather yourself. I don't know what the what it is about that. When I lived in Indonesia... Indonesia was a, not, is 12 hours or 11 hours, depending on the time of the year, from the United States. Indonesia's on the equator, so they didn't change anything. So imagine traveling east, you know, and you're 12 hours difference. Now Israel's seven hours ahead of New York. So it really was, it took about a week to 10 days to kind of get myself back. It was a very, very exciting tour. We had a wonderful time. Uh, in the United States, and um, um, but it, it does take a little time to gather yourself back when you when you return here, back to Israel. It well, we're glad you made it here, and glad you made oh. it back safely. So we're good for that again. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and move into this first caller. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where you're calling from? Hi, it's Brophy calling in from the heart of the Hasidic community in Muncie, New York. Mm. I'd like to know like this. I've been thinking about how the Christians have tampered with the Tanakh, and they've changed a lot of the holy words to suit their agenda. As Rabbi Singer points out many times, just one of those examples being in Tehillim 2.12, Psalms 2.12. And I was trying to figure out what the motive of these tampering editors to make these changes would really be. Because logically, I can't conclude that they actually ideologically believed that this was the Word of God, because if somebody actually believes this is the word of God, how could they have the audacity to go at it with the ancient equivalent of whiteout? I mean, who would do that? So when I was imagining any ulterior motives, I was wondering what would they have gained if, for instance, they didn't actually believe this was the word of God? Was there some kind of other benefit that the church would have gained at that point in time? You know, back when the, the founding fathers went and made their changes, Originally, I know there's many translations available now, but in the, the first time period when they did the first changes, what what could have possibly could have possibly been an ulterior motive? Was there any massive political power or monetary gain that they would have gained from converting Jews? I was wondering if Rabbi Singh could just give us a broader picture of the history of those times. Right on, absolutely. Thank you very much. All right, go ahead and hang up now. Thank you for your answer, Rabbi. Thank you. That's a great, good question. That's a really yeah. good question, and as it turns out, we know a lot about those times because the earliest surviving Christian literature is with us, the letters of Paul, and we know a lot about those times. As an example, the, there are 13 letters that are attributed to Paul. Seven of them, at least seven of them, are actually from his hand. So we, and they were all written during the 50s. And one of the things we know is that 
the the people who were being converted at the time to Christianity, although they didn't use the term Christians during that period, did not use the term Christian about themselves. Others did. And we find in the Christian Bible the word Christian used, not Christianity, uh, but it's used by people who are not Christians. But we're going to use these terms. They're conventional. They work well. The people at the time who were becoming Christians were Gentiles. We see that from the letters of Paul. That means in the 50s, and that's when all the seven letters of Paul, the indisputed letters of Paul, were being written from, let's say, 1 Thessalonians, the earliest, to Romans, the last of the seven. At the time, it was largely a Gentile movement, not trying to convert Jews to Christianity. They would have liked to, but that's not who was coming in. It was the non-Jews. What historically was going on at the time? Something remarkable. And this is often lost. During the first century, in the early part of the first century, there was an enormous amount of conversion to Judaism. There was enormous interest in the Jewish faith, in some ways like as we are today, right now. As we are today, where there's this very, uh, where there's interest among non-Jews about Judaism, and, and there were a lot of conversions to Judaism. Imagine for a moment, if someone was considering converting to Judaism, what might get in the way of that conversion? If someone contemplated uh, becoming a Jew, you person couldn't fathom any longer that the that the emperors of Rome were really gods, and they was just they couldn't swallow the beliefs of the of the the gods of the Greco-Roman world, Jupiter and, and so on. They and they were attracted to monotheism, what might get in the way, what might be a speed bump along the way, all of two things. Number one, um, people may have trouble keeping the commandments. They may find that it's just difficult to keep kosher. It's just difficult to keep the Sabbath. That might get in the way, and circumcision, of course. That's why, even to this day, the vast majority of people who convert to Judaism that's likely the reason are, are women, not men. If you present a religion that says that you share in the covenant and that you have the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by believing in Jesus and you don't have to keep the commandments any longer and you don't have to be circumcised. In fact, Paul will make the case very strongly in his letters Clear. I mean, Galatians 3, 4, 5, 6, it's really all over the place, that you share in the covenant and the body of Christ. There is no Jew nor Gentile. That's, that's the whole point. That's the last passage of Galatians 3. So then you have something amazing to sell because you can deliver on, you have the, the promises that God made to Israel and you don't have to keep the commandments, and you have the covenant, and you don't have to be circumcised. In fact, you shouldn't be circumcised, and that's the case that Paul's going to emphasize throughout that letter and other letters. So therefore, it's very easy to see what is happening here. However, the church had a huge problem, and this problem goes back to the earliest, these earliest surviving letters of Paul. And that is, how do you explain a way the Jews, who, for the most part, the vast majority of Jewish people, are saying that Christianity is a false religion, that Jesus is not the Messiah. That this is a terrible mistake. That there's there's nothing in the Jewish scriptures that describes that you need to believe that the Messiah died and rose from the dead in order to be saved. There's not a verse that says that anywhere. Even Christians can't make the case that there's a single verse anywhere in the Hebrew Bible that says that if you believe that the Messiah rose from the dead, then you are saved. There's no even inference for that. Nothing like that. Zero. This is an enormous problem because in the Jewish Bible, you have commandments over that how to live your life, how you can dress. Can a man dress like a woman? How do, what foods you can eat, what foods you can't eat. I mean, real details. 
And yet, not a word about the most important thing. In Paul's preaching, the most important thing is Christ crucified. The most important thing is that Jesus rose from the dead according to the scripture in 1 Corinthians 15. Although he provides no scripture, for good reason, it doesn't exist. How do you explain away why don't the Jews believe? Well, why? What's the problem with the Jews? That means, why does this pose a problem? Because the idea of a Messiah is uniquely Jewish. No one else had the idea of a Messiah but the Jews. The word Christ meant nothing to the Greco-Roman world. It, it, the idea of a Messiah was it just wasn't a part of the henotheism. That the, that the Roman Empire embraced. So if, it's, if the Jewish people bring us the oracles of God, and Paul concedes that in Romans chapter 3, verse 2, and they're the only ones who know how to read it, only and salvation is of the Jews, it's expressed to us in the book of John, and that doesn't mean salvation, what people think, that sort of Jesus died for our sins and therefore he came for the Jews. It means the context in, in a conversation with a Samaritan woman is that you Samaritans were not really Jewish. You don't know, your fathers don't know, and the Jews do know. The Jews desperately needed a Messiah during the first century, and the Jews then, as today, had a reputation for being very intelligent. Why don't the Jews believe in this? And the problem is that if this is really so important that Jesus died for our sins, then why is it found nowhere in the Jewish scriptures? So what you had to do was manufacture verses in the, in the Christian Bible, misuse texts that are in the Jewish scriptures in order to make it appear as though God was bringing in the Gentiles, misquoting Hosea chapter 2. When Paul wants to make the case that, in fact, this was an epic of the Gentiles, which he'll do in Romans 9, 10, and 11, so he'll say that it was prophesied that those who are not my people will be called my people. As it turns out, if you look up Hosea chapter 2, the it has nothing to do with Gentiles. Hosea chapter 2 is referring to the ten lost tribes. It's talking about Hosea's children, who, the, who are the children of a prostitute whom he married, who were called names like, you're not my people, I will not have mercy on you. But eventually, the ten tribes that were carried off by the Assyrian Empire 2,700 years ago would be restored. It's nothing to do with Gentiles. And Christians are not guided to look this up. Christians never look this up. Christians never look up. When Paul says that in Romans 9.25, Christians just simply take it at his word, or they may look up that one verse in Hosea chapter 2 and don't look up the context. And if you don't look up the context, you are dead you are finished. You have no chance of protecting the integrity of your relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's not possible. Because Tanakh, you have to at least read it from the beginning of the chapter. You don't really need Tovi Singer. You don't need this rabbi. You just All you need to do is look it up for yourself. Paul had to explain away repeatedly why the Jews don't believe in Jesus. And so did the writers of the Gospels. And they concocted a whole series of reasons. This had to be explained away. And to Paul, the ends justify the means. It made no difference how you did it. You had to do it. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, 21. He says to the Jew, I become like I'm a Jew. He's completely chameleon, that I may gain the Jews. To those who are not Jewish, I become as one who is not Jewish, that I may gain those who are not under the law. I can become all things by all men, that by somehow I may gain them for Christ. I mean, just read it. Paul is saying he's 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 telling you what you need to do. That is be come completely chameleon. The ends justify the means. You know what's crazy about the verse you quoted in Psalm 2, verse 12? 
In Psalm 2, verse 12, the text says, Nashkubar Penyanov, which means arm yourself with purity lest he be angry. This is the end of the second psalm. The church would change that to read, kiss the sun. I'm not kidding. But it's not even quoted in the Christian Bible because they never even thought of that fake at the time. It's not in any of Paul's writings. Somebody later on, probably in the late second century, came up with this convoluted idea of taking the word bar, which means purity in Hebrew, but it's, and then translating it in Aramaic, as though it's an Aramaic word. So in Aramaic, the word bar means son. Nashku, neshek, is a homonym, which means either arm or kiss. It's a homonym. And then switched it. But that switcheroo, that fake, was not even invented during the first century. You could be sure Matthew would have loved such a reading. Paul would have been all over it. So much, most of the verses and all these convoluted proof texts that are used widely by Christian missionaries don't even appear in the New Testament. Why? Don't even appear in the Apostolic Fathers. Don't You won't find it in, in, in Clement of Rome's epistle to Corinth. He doesn't quote it. He would have loved such a reading. He would have gone gangbusters over it. We find it later on in the writings of the church fathers, in the patristic writings. That means this is ongoing, ongoing, new, convoluted, convoluted. Why are they doing it? Because they got to explain away why Jesus is the Messiah from the Jewish scriptures. Because if you're claiming he's the Messiah and you want people to support you in every way and financially, in that same 1 Corinthians 9, look it up for yourself. In that same 1 Corinthians 9, but just dial back, not verse 20 we talked about earlier, where Paul says that you have to be chameleon in order to evangelize, and the ends justify the means. Just dial that back, not to verse 20, but go back to verse 10. Go back to 9, verse 9, 10, right there, Paul says, mis- no, he doesn't misquote it. The Torah says in Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, you, there's a prohibition in the Torah of muzzling a ox when it's treading your field, when it's treading the very food that it eats. You can't put a muzzle on it because that is a causes an animal tremendous stress, and you're not allowed to be cruel to an animal. It's in the Torah. Many, many, many commandments about, are about how to treat animals. And our means of slaughter is unique to cause the minimum amount of pain. And Paul says, believe me, no, don't believe me, please look it up. In 1 Corinthians 9, he says, do you, when it says in the law of Moses that you should not muzzle an ox when it's treading, do you think God cares about oxen? And then Paul will make the, will claim that it's really referring to that you have to give money to missionaries. Do I need to say more? That means I don't need to, we don't need to do mind reading here. What I am going to is 1 Corinthians. Very important point here. So very important point. 1 Corinthians is no doubt from the hand of Paul. It's one of those indisputed letters of Paul. One other point. When Paul wrote those letters, he did not think he was writing scripture. Those letters were meant to be letters. They're epistles. They were letters written to churches with, with an exception, with exception Romans. He's, he is writing letters to churches that he had already established and trouble was brewing. And he was responding to problems that had emerged in different churches, whether churches in in Greece, in Asia Minor, that would be Galatians. Paul, when he wrote his his epistles, he was not writing what he thought to be Scripture, what he thought would be part of a, a canon of the New Testament, what he thought were part of the Gospels, although Paul used the term Gospel more frequently than anyone does, but he does not mean the Gospel like in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is very important. 
Paul believed that he was writing letters to churches that he had established. Romans, his most important epistle, is a church that he had not yet visited. He will visit it later on. So he doesn't think he's writing a Bible. He's trying to convince people in these churches that the people who are trying to influence these new Christians were wrong, and they should listen to him because what I have is directly from Jesus Christ, and it's not from Jerusalem, not from the supposed pillars of the church. Read Galatians 1 and 2. Read Philippians 3. It's all over the place. That's what Paul is seeking to do. So he doesn't think he's writing a Bible. The church will include Paul's letters, both those that are indisputed, the seven and the other six, into a into the New Testament, into the 27 books. And another letter that we don't know who wrote it, but the church fathers believed, not all, but many believed it was written by Paul, and that's Hebrews. So that would be included as well. Okay, So he didn't think he was writing the Bible. He didn't think he was writing the New Testament. He didn't think any of those things. These were letters, and they were letters responding to problems in churches, and he wanted to set out his Christology, and he won. Paul's view wins, and his enemies, his interlocutors, those who he posed, were not Jews like me. They're not Pharisees. They were fellow Christians, but fellow Christians that held a different Christology, and Paul's is repeatedly seeking to convey that he ha- what he has directly He's a super apostle, and what he has is directly from Jesus, not from Jerusalem, and Peter is a is a hypocrite, and he claims that he conveyed that to Peter to his face in in Second Galatians 2, verse 11, in Antioch, and so it's all over the place. His conflict with fellow Christians is is recorded by in the Christian Bible, in the book of Acts, his his problem with Barnabas, Barnabas's cousin Mark. Forget it; it's all over the place. We don't have to speculate about speculate about this because it's it's all very embarrassing. This would never have been recorded if it wasn't authentic. So that's why they did it. They wanted power. That was very important to Paul. That people should follow him. He was a, a person who people did, didn't get along with, and I'm sure you met people like that. He kind of had the personality of Sigmund Freud. He's not the kind of person you'd want to have dinner with. And people had a lot of trouble with him. He And he wouldn't travel with Mark. I mean, he didn't get it. Barnabas. Barnabas was the very person we are told in the book of Acts who introduces Paul to all the big shots in the Jerusalem church. And he cuts off relations with him. So it, this is not something that I'm speaking this is not a speculation. This is very clear in the text, and the criteria of embarrassment conveys to us that these are authentic events. The church has a very big problem of explaining why doesn't the, why do the Jews utterly reject this claim? This has to be explained away, and the one answer that can't be used by any Christian, by any evangelist, is the, the truth. They can't from then to this day, in no church can the doctors of Christendom state that the reason why Jews don't believe in Jesus is because they read these verses, they read these passages in the Holy Bible, and they draw a different conclusion. You will never hear that in church, and you will never find anything like that in the Christian Bible. But that's the truth. Why? Because if if Paul would have said that, just say the truth, then everyone would go, but why do they read it differently? After all, they're the only ones who can read the book in its original language. You have to explain away why the Jews don't believe it when it's their book. The Messiah is a promise made to the Jews, to no one else. The Messiah himself is Jewish. They're the ones who are waiting for a Messiah. The fact that the Jews don't believe in Jesus pose an enormous credibility problem to the church. And therefore, the the writers of the New Testament all had to come with all kinds of convoluted reasons why the Jews don't believe in it. 
the Jews are simply the children of the devil, John 8, 44. We're the seed of the devil, and therefore, if you're the devil, you know the truth, but deny it anyway. We're, we're under the power of Satan, and in fact, the places we worship are are the synagogues of Satan, seeing the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. I'm not making this up. It's right there. These are not inferences. It's clearly stated. There's, This is not like I'm not trying to characterize the Christian Bible in the way that this is what's there. Paul is going to st- say the astonishing that because it's foolishness to the Jew, because the Jew cannot believe it, because this is a a stumbling block for the Jews, because the Jews consider this outrageous, it therefore must be true, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 25. Please, please, please look it up for yourself. Look it up for yourself because if you're not familiar with these texts, you might believe what people say about me that I'm just anti-Christian and, and maybe I'm doing to the Christians what they do to us. Maybe I'm mischaracterizing the Christian Bible because I don't like I'm like them and I, I don't want you to believe that. So it's very important for me to say, look it up, read it in context. I want you to be empowered. So the motive is power. Paul was very interested in people following him and following no one else. And he tells us that the ends justify the means. Mm-hmm. And Paul's approach re- remains to this day where we have missionaries here in the land of Israel who lie, claim they're rabbis, and they're not even Jewish. We have people in in Eretz Israel who are not even Jewish, and claim they're a rabbi, claim they're, there's a, one guy who said he's a scribe and behaved like a scribe, performed circumcision, and it's a complete lie. And the missionaries are so embarrassed because all the evidence is out, they have to admit that it's a big lie. Well, why did he do it? Because he had a good teacher. His teacher was Paul. This is the behavior of the church. Alter the text, not a problem at all. Fake conversion documents, no problem at all. We have missionaries all over this country, and it's a huge problem in North America of missionaries who are posing as ordinary members of Orthodox congregations, lying through their teeth. Why? Because the ends justifies the means. In Judaism, it never does. Right. And thankfully, we don't need to engage in this. And they, I think I want to just say this. I don't know that I've ever shared this. I believe, I can't prove this, but I am convinced that the chicanery that we find in the Christian Bible is so outrageous that it almost is supernatural, meaning that I think that HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed the church to do this and future, later editors not to correct this because, so it should be transparent to anyone who's interested that they could do tshuva and repent. That's how outrageous the corruptions are both in the Christian Bible and the corruptions of the church that would follow. And now it's time for all the nations to come to that moment when they will speak in a pure speech, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9, and we'll see the coming of the true Mashiach, Bemheda Biyamenu, quickly in our time. Thank you for that question. Man, awesome, awesome. All right, that was that was a great answer. All right, we're going to take the next caller. We're getting flooded with calls, guys. Don't give up. If you're trying to call in, just keep pressing in, and once you do get through, uh, don't hang up. There's gonna, you're just going to have to wait on hold while Rabbi finishes his topic, uh, but definitely don't hang up. Numbers on uh, actually in the chat as well, so if you need to find it. And, Andrea, thank you for all your help in, in the, uh, doing the work on the YouTube chat. Okay, call it. You're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Uh, Rabbi Sanger, this is uh, Todd in Cleveland. Uh, one of the principal claims that Christianity has is from John 3, 5 through 7, which is you needed to be born again uh, from the Holy Spirit in order to be saved or in order to atone for your sins. Now, it seems that they're having a tough time finding this directly in the Hebrew Bible, uh, but the one verse that they seem to cite uh, is Ezekiel thirty six twenty five. 
uh, which talks uh, uh, about, uh, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your uncleanness and from all your fetishes. So I was wondering if you could comment about that. Uh, it really does not seem to uh, support directly from Ezekiel uh, that this is the only way to receive atonement. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel in chapters 18, 33, and others seems to be one of the principal proponents indicating that repentance uh, combines with God's action in order to atone for sins. And with High Holy Days coming up, I was wondering if you could comment about that. Okay. Very good. Rabbi, you clear? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Very good. Go ahead. Now you can tune in for your answer. Thank you. So, John 3 uh, contains a very famous conversation, we are told, between Jesus and Nicodemus. And what's very famous about it is that the, it contains a double entendre where Nicodemus, we are told, a, a figure we don't find in Synoptic Gospels, uh, and a Pharisee, wants to know about salvation. And Jesus is going to tell him that you need to be born again. It's a fictitious story. It has to be, because that conversation could only have been conducted in, in Aramaic. In Greek, it works, where Jesus tells Nicodemus, in fact, you need to be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. And in the Greek, that could mean, that term born again could mean um, to be reborn, to be re regenerated, meaning reborn, that's where we get the word from, or it can mean to be born from above. And there's a double entendre, the Nicodemus doesn't get it, and Jesus Justice all over them. Uh, as it turns out, in the book of Ezekiel, we're told very clearly prior to chapter 36, if you're starting with 36, you may find yourself in a little trouble. It's Ezekiel's uh, messianic passages, the rich messianic passages, start, begin a little bit earlier, very famously with Ezekiel 34 the Good Shepherd, that in order for the Jewish people and which would who would lead the world back to God, in order for that to occur, they need a proper leader, and their leaders are, are atrocious, and they must be replaced. And ultimately, that Good Shepherd is Mashiach, who is led by God, and we're told that in these chapters. And once the Jewish people have a proper leadership, they will rise to the occasion. They could become a light to the nations. God will remove that uh, heart made of stone and give them a, a heart made of flesh, and there'll be an enormous transformation. As it turns out, these passages demonstrate that Jesus is not the Messiah because none of those things occurred. As it turns out, when we read Ezekiel 34, 35, 36, the passage you quoted from, 37, they're going to follow the Messiah who's called the Prince, not only here, but he's called the Prince earlier in chapter 34. The Messiah himself is going to instruct and encourage the children of Israel to keep the commandments and observe the statutes. See, now we know how this is going to occur, and as a result of that, they're going to be forgiven. And in fact, it's Ezekiel 33 that tells us, I mean, I'm staying in context. I don't even have to go back to Ezekiel 18. In Ezekiel 33, we're told that the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked. And being a leader requires you to take responsibility for your flock. That's right there. So I would posit that e Ezekiel, the prophet of blessed memory, who lived roughly 2,500 years ago during the destruction of the first temple, of the first temple, anticipated the reading 36 that you've read the chapters that introduce it. But there is nowhere in Ezekiel that says that some that an innocent person could die for the sins of the wicked. It's nowhere found. This is the core teachings of the church. There is not a single passage, not just in the book of Ezekiel, but we can go to the other 38 books of Tanakh, or 
other 23 books of Tanakh, depending how you count the books, and you'll find not a single passage anywhere that says that the Messiah will rise from the dead, and if you believe in the resurrection, you are saved, and if you don't believe in it, you're lost. There's not one verse that conveys the core central teachings of the church, the core central teaching of John chapter 3. Not one, zero. There's not even inference to this. Nothing. You could talk Isaiah 53 all you want. There is nothing, even according to the Christians who quote this verse, Christians, missionaries who quote Isaiah 53, have all their work in front of them. Because there's not a verse in Isaiah 53 that says that the Messiah will resurrect from the, de- from the dead, and it is his resurrection or belief in his resurrection that will save you, and rejecting it, you'll be lost. Nowhere. Zero. It's not there at all. So what Ezekiel is telling us, is conveying to us, that it is obedience to Hashem now, certainly, that habol the Messiah, Messiah, I say, a person who comes to purify himself so God helps that person, helps that person along. And that will be a time of the messianic age and the, the era that will bring it about will be propitious for people to repent. And hopefully we are observing that in our time. So there's nothing about John in John chapter 3 anywhere found in the Jewish scriptures. Zero. And in John chapter 3, you're going to have quotes of other silly things that it, it said that's speaking about, you know, terribly uh, the snake on the on the, bro- the bronze snake and all that. That has nothing to do with any of the things that are being conveyed in John. So therefore, it's not there at all. Nowhere found there. And as you said correctly, in Ezekiel 18, once again, we are told, the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked. Is it my desire at all that the wicked should perish? Is it not rather, and here are the key words, is it not rather that he should turn, the wicked should turn from his sinful ways that he might live? There it is. I mean, what do you need? I mean, there, it, it, it can't be more clear. Thank you for that question. Very good. All right, we're going to move on to the next caller. You are live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Caller, you're live on the air. Okay, there's a good uh, point right there. If you guys do call in, uh, don't walk away from your phone. Uh, if you're watching the TV or your computer, about 10 or 15 second delay. Uh, actually, the caller just hang up. So phone lines open, 855-952-4253. Uh, and also, uh, I'll plug this in real fast if you haven't done it yet. Go to outreachjudaism.org uh, to find Rabbi's uh, two-volume book set. The CDs on screen are no longer available. They're out of print, but the audio files are available. Just go to that website, click on the free audio tab, and you'll want to study these these two books uh, in line with the titles that are listed in the audio files. It's not an audio book. It's actually additional information. To reverse that, that would be the primary, and the books are additional information, which makes them both that much more dynamic. So, uh, outreachjudaism.org. Thank you, guys. All right, callers, uh, let's see. There's no caller yet. Yep, there it is right there. All right, Kali, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Hi, um, this is Josh from the UK. Welcome, Josh. Um, I had the pleasure of talking to the rabbi last Sunday, uh, and I asked a question, and you responded, and you gave me a generous opportunity to respond. Uh, but I was cut off at the end, and I just wanted to make a last comment, so if you don't mind, I'll just summarize and uh, make that comment, and I'd like to hear your final response to it. <coughs> Sorry, and uh, then I'll have a follow-up question if you don't mind. Actually, let's so, do, let's do I'm this. Calling... We, we have a lot of callers. If you would just present your question, yeah. and we can go with that uh, because we need to free up the phone lines for other callers. Absolutely. So uh, I, I'm not going to argue. I'm genuinely grappling with many of the axioms that I grew up believing as a Christian. Sure. And so whatever conclusion I get to at the end, you know, I just want to get there rationally and with consistent thought process. Uh, last last Sunday, I challenged you regarding a uh, rabbi. I challenged you regarding the, the charge that you often make towards Christians that they are idolaters because of the belief in the Trinity. Uh, I argued that Christians unanimously believe that in one God, while the concept of the Trinity is nothing but an explanation of God's nature as revealed in the New Testament. Uh, and uh, I also said that Christians have uh, have answers that make them conclude that God is one. So they can't be charged with idolatry, in my opinion. 
part of your response was that, well, all religions have answers. And I do agree with you. But my point is that the conclusion of those answers, not the fact that they have answers is what matters because the, the answers are only as good as the scripture reveals. And if we can establish that the scriptures are accurate and inspired, and even if those concepts and the language used are unconventional, as, as you mentioned last time, such as the unconventional language around the hypostasis, uh, hypostasis union, it would not matter in my opinion that it is unconventional. In, in other words, the unconventionality is not a valid issue uh, if if a new if there is a new revelation, you know, like the concept of achdut in, in uh, Judaism, Abu Dazara and Brit Milah, circumcision as a sign of covenant, was unconventional at the time of Abraham Avinu to his culture. And so, just because something is unconventional, is I don't think it's a valid uh, point against the, 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 the what what somebody is trying to make. Um, and uh, any revelation, you know, um, you know, should be well, judged. Let me I think. Keep you on and and and. Thank you for joining me. And let me, let's, if we can, let's parse this out. Let's just make sense out of this. The unconventionality I'm referring to is the language that the church uses, that Christians employ to describe the doctrine of the Trinity and why it is logical, rational, and more importantly, why it comports with the Jewish scriptures. And the fact that the church uses language that's unconventional, nobody refers to a person, there's one person, there are three people, no one refers to, the, uses the word person in the way that Christians use and employ the word person in the Nicene Creed and earlier iterations of the church fathers. And when the church is using terms, Greek terms like hypostatic union, again, a term which is unconventional, and 99.9% .9 of Christians, and I'm being charitable, have no clue what that word means, that, de I need you to understand this, that demonstrates that the church is engaging in a game of hide the ball, they're in dealing from the bottom of the deck, and this is chicanery, because instead, Christ, the church, not saying you, but the church uh, routinely uses this kind of language, which is unconventional, which no one uses it in that way, and the charge is very serious. They're doing that for nefarious reasons, that's all. And the reason, don't be insulted, please, but the reason I said that to you is because you specifically use the term person. You, in our conversation, use the word, you were referring to hypostatic union. And therefore, I said these words mean nothing. I mean, what do they mean? That's what I was saying. Now, so that's what unconventional means. Conversely, in contrast, Tanakh, when the Torah says there's one God and there's no other, Tanakh uses the simplest terms possible. There's one. I mean, do you really, in order to know the true nature of God, and I thank you very much for calling, in order to know the true nature of God, do you have to go to a university and have a, a degree in systematic theology? In order, Judaism is a faith of God, the faith that God gave us, that a four-year-old can understand. That's the whole point of it, that you don't need to be a scholar in order to be a follower of the Jewish faith. But in order to follow the beliefs of Christianity, apparently you have to have advanced degrees in systematic theology, and even then the church will concede it's a mystery. So what I have conveyed is that the use of words these are not an anachronisms. They're in words that are used in a way that no one else would use them is deliberate. This is not this is not a sophistication. This is sophistry. This is fake. It's phony. It's false. That's what I'm explaining. That's what I want people to know. I want people to know that the reason why they're using terms like person and so on is because they're trying, they want Christians to believe something that the mind would otherwise reject. In contrast, 
when the when the Navi, the prophet Isaiah says, "You are my witnesses," declares the Lord, "my servant whom I have chose, the man Tedu, so that you should know, the Saminuli, and you should believe me, and the Savino, and understand." It's Isaiah forty three verse ten. Okay, so the the prophet tells us, "You are my witnesses, so that you will know." Believe me and comprehend. Okay, so there's no fancy words there. What is it that we're supposed to know? Ki anihu, because I am Him. It means I am God. Lafani before me, loy noiser el. Before me, there was no God formed. V'acharai loyihia, and after me there will be none. I mean, just contrast. Isaiah 43, verse 10. It's a very famous passage. I want you to know, and I want everyone to know, Judaism is not a religion for people who have an IQ over 130. It's not. It's a, every person could understand it. How, are people gonna, how is an 8-year-old going to know what a hypostatic union means when 40-year-olds don't know it who are devout Christians? And then the next passage. See, I want to just show you how false, how grotesquely false the teaching of the church is. Look at 43 verse 11. Anoichi, I, Anoichi, I am the Lord, the Ein Milvadai Moshia, and besides me, there is no Savior. There we are. Nice, easy words. Very clear. You don't have to be a fancy. We're not a fancy. Fancy religion, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, conveyed his eternal oracles in a language that everybody can understand. A five-year-old little girl, she can understand. There's one Hashem, there's no other. And that's how it's given this way. And the moment you, we introduce unconventional language, it's the church is doing that to mask the, the fact that Trinity is a fake, phony doctrine that was invented, the church was stuck with it because the church essentially had the problem that there were uh, Christians that believed that Jesus was human and not God, Ebionites and Nazarenes. There were other Christians who believed that they, that Jesus was completely divine and Ignatius, for example, one of the earliest church fathers, he didn't try to solve that conundrum, but you could be sure that future, later church fathers tried. And you don't have to go much further. They tried to figure out, because which is it? If the Father is God and Jesus is God, then you have two gods. But we believe that there's only one God. You can have two. And therefore, the very person who invents the term Trinity a church, a Latin church father from the African continent, from Carthage, Tertullian, invents the word. But he himself did not believe that the son, the second person of the triune Godhead, was of the same substance as the father. He completely rejected that, and his Christology was rejected by the church, and he was considered a heretic for this even though he's embraced because of his influence. And Origen also didn't believe it. And he was, I, I can assure you, the brightest Christian apologist in history. They, they couldn't do it. And they're using all kinds of very complicated systems to try to explain away what, and ultimately the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed that emerged from it, essentially just goes we surrender, and that is, it's a mystery. That's why if you look at the Nicene Creed that is read in churches worldwide, it's, it, believe me, it's not copyrighted anymore, it's online. Look it up for yourself. You'll notice that in the Nicene Creed, when the Father is described, the nature of the Father is described, it's a very short description. The Holy Spirit is rather short. The, the, the description of the sun, the role of the sun, is very complicated. Why? Because it's fake and chicanery, because I have to explain something which is completely made up, evolved, and in fact, the, what emerges out of Nicaea is that uh, the teachings of a priest from Alexandria, 
his ideas would win out over another thinker from the exact same place in North Africa, and that Jesus was very God of very God. So the fake, the chicanery lies in the language. Why do we need to use this language? And to demonstrate that this is illicit, all we need to do is look at the Hebrew Bible, because Christians profess a belief that in the Hebrew Scriptures that it is the Word of God. Christians claim they believe that the Hebrew Bible is the Word of God. In fact, the New Testament makes that clear by not only supposedly quoting from the Jewish Scriptures, but by saying so explicitly in many places and saying that Jesus' Messiahship was foretold by not just the Torah, by the prophets and by the Psalms. Luke 24, verse 44. See 2 Timothy 3.16. But it's, it's right there. So what happens is that they're stuck with the Jewish Bible, and if you're not stuck with the Jewish Bible, you don't have to come on to this. So that is what I'm conveying very clearly. And I need people to wake up. And just because you say that you believe in one God does not mean you believe in one God. Just because you insist that I'm a monotheist doesn't make you a monotheist when you use fake words. You, that doesn't make you a monotheist. So you, th this is a complex equation. I, I know you mean well, but what you're saying is because Christians claim they're monotheists, because Christians claim they believe in one God, they therefore believe in one God, and they therefore are not idol worshippers. And that is that is not correct. That's what I want to show you. That's what is so clear, that just because you claim you believe in one God doesn't mean that you believe in one God. Right? Christianity is not a monotheism, although it claims it is. It's a henotheism. It's, a, it's a, an idea that was very well developed in the Greco-Roman world, and it just uses the, the, the thumb sketches of Judaism, but in reality... So I encourage people, if you want to be sure that what I'm conveying is clear, please contrast the, the statements of radical monotheism found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adinoy Eloheinu, Adinoy Echod. Contrast that, Lahavda, with persons and hypostatic unions, and you see right away, this is not the same signature. I, mean, I, I just want to explain this in a way in another way, very briefly, so I don't know how banking is done today in the United States. I'm not sure. But I recall that if you, let's say I needed cash from my checking account. I, I'm sure I could do this today. So you could walk into a bank, wherever you are in the West, I'm sure, and you could take out your checkbook, write a check to yourself or cash, and then you sign it and sign the back. And then you hand the check to the teller, and what happens next? Does the teller immediately hand you cash? No, you would have to show ID. But there's one other thing the teller is going to do. The person, the person, the person who represents the bank is going to do when you pass him a check asking for cash. You need two hundred dollars in cash. The store you want to buy from won't take a credit card. The teller will go back to the signature card that was used when you originally opened up the bank account and compare the signature on the check you've just presented to the signature on the signature card that the bank possesses. And they look at them. And if they match, so then they'll hand you the cash. And if they don't match, then they won't hand you the cash. They won't cash the check for you. This is what's happening. The church is submitting a, a check with a signature that has no, bears no resemblance to the signature of the prophets of Israel, and therefore we reject it. It's not the word of Hashem. That's what's really going on here. Christianity can work if you, don't, if, if you take a Marcionite view and reject the Jewish scriptures. It alone can work. 
there are internal problems in the Christian Bible. I want to ignore that to make the point. Just let's ignore the internal inconsistencies. Christianity is the reason why it is so easy to fail is because it's making truth claims. And the most important is that it is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Bible. That's everywhere in the Christian Bible. And then what we do, what anyone should do, is look at the signature card of the Christian Bible and then examine that, contrast these terms used by the church with the terms that are used in the Hebrew Bible, and immediately you will reject it. You don't even have to call the bank manager. You immediately know this is a completely different signature. This is not a different orientation. It's a completely different teaching, and the church seeks to mask this by using weird language, unconventional language. That is what is being conveyed here. And that's why every child of God, not just Jew, all every child of God must reject out of hand these extru- these 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 fantastic claims of the church that have no fantastic evidence is supported. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, very good, Rabbi. We're going to take this next caller. I'm getting a lot of questions in chat about uh, the phone lines. Guys, you're just going to have to try to call in when there's so many callers. You just got to kind of, it's like, I don't know, playing jump rope or something. You just got to get in at the right time. So, uh, Issa Shabo, I hope I said your name right. Yeah, just keep trying, okay? Uh, if you can't get through, feel free to leave a message. To leave your name and your question just in, in, in really like as quick and simple as you can, and we might be able to get back to it. So, uh, caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Uh, this is uh, Michael calling from Indiana. Michael, welcome. Okay, uh, I got a couple questions for the rabbi. Um, he can answer them in any um, direction he want to go with it. Let's, um, the first real, real, real quickly, call. hold on just a second. Uh, real quickly, uh, for and this is not just for you, but for everybody else who's watching. We're going to limit this one question per caller because there's so many callers and we don't want to take up too much time and not share the space, okay? So pick up your most dynamic okay. one and let's go with that one, okay? Okay. Uh, well, I guess the the first one would be, or the one I'm going to ask you is uh, concerning uh, Paul's writings where he stated that um, the, that the Mashiach would be uh, resurrected on the third day according to the scriptures. Is there any scripture to support that? Because it would seem like in the, even like when you go in the Gospels, the only thing that I think that they have to stand on is the story of Jonah. But when you go into the story of Jonah, it it doesn't seem like it's a prophecy or anything. It's just basically a story about a situation that happened with Jonah. So is there anything to kind of support that angle of a Mashiach resurrecting on the third day or whatnot? Hey, that's a a great question. Yeah, very good. All right, go ahead and hang up now. You can tune in for your answer, okay? Thank you, sir. All right. All right, bye-bye. All right, everybody, take it away. That's good. No, they were, he's asking a fantastic question. First Corinthians chapter 15. This is a really important chapter um, for Christians on, on, on the crucifixion and resurrection. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's what it says in First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 4. Okay? Now, what you would expect is the next verse, and Paul does this in other places, he then quotes or misquotes the scriptures, but he quotes something. What is strikingly obvious here is that he quotes nothing, but rather goes in in verse 5 that Jesus then appeared to the 12, he appeared to Caiaphas and and himself and so on, 500 and so on. That means where is, that's like, that's the bang the bang of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4 is according to the scriptures. And then there is no scriptures. Where are those scriptures? Where is a scripture? And it isn't there. And again, you can't argue that it was Paul's style not to quote scriptures because that's exactly not the case. He usually does misquote scriptures, but he's misquoting something. I'm not going through all of it, but it is all over the place. In fact, it is Matthew and Paul that quote the Hebrew Bible more frequently than any any other writer in the New Testament. So he's that's the that's the normal game. But here there's no scriptures. And there isn't because there's no scripture anywhere that says that the Messiah will rise on the third day. Nowhere. And if it's said that in the Jewish Bible, I would be in the Church of Holy Holy Sepulchre in about 25 minutes. That's all it would take for me to walk there. We all would. 
if it's said in the Jewish Bible that the Messiah is going to be killed and he's going to be buried, he's going to spend three days in the tomb and on the third day he's going to rise and it said that, what Paul said, we'd all be in church. We're not crazy. We're not, I'm not anti-Christian. The re- there's nothing like that. The only v- verses that Christians can use is they will point to Hosea chapter 6, and they don't say this anywhere, but if you had a Christian um, reference Bible, so they'll throw in Hosea 6, and whoever did that had to be praying, please don't look it up. Please, please don't look it up. Please don't look it up. Because if you look it up in context, you'll see it's talking about the northern tribes. It's talking about Menasha, that ultimately they were carried away during the first temple. So that's one day. In the second day, they'll be gone. And on the third, they will be restored, which means in the final temple, there'll be the restoration of the northern tribes. I beg you to look up the end of Hosea chapter 5. Just look it up for yourself. I don't care what Bible you use. Use your King James. Use your Living Bible. Use your Dying Bible. Use whatever Bible you want. Okay, So it isn't there. So that's why Paul doesn't quote, because there's nothing even to quote. It doesn't exist. How did he get away with it? The answer is he did. It worked. Christianity is the most popular religion in the world. One out of three people on this planet believe in one iteration of Christianity or another because people are lazy and don't look it up. And people, I think, presume that I wouldn't lie in such a transparent way. Even if you're not an honest person, you would do something to... This is like naked. Like, I, I, of course it has to say it somewhere. When I speak to Christians, and I spoke to more than a few in my life, they're all shocked to hear this. They're all picking up their Bible and ruffling through the pages. And there are Christians watching me now who are doing exactly that and are trying to figure out how to respond to this. Why didn't you figure it out the first time you read 1 Corinthians 15? Why do you need to hear it from Rabbi Tovia Singer and then start looking up commentaries on the Christian Bible to come up with an answer? Why didn't you look it up the first time? I don't, I don't look at it personally, but he got away with it. This is not the only place where fake verses are quoted that are phantom verses that exist nowhere. He got away with it because people are, please don't be angry. People are lazy. I have to conclude that, that people just don't read the context. People just don't look it up for themselves. When they look it up, they look at one verse. They don't look it up in context. That's just the way it is. Why? I don't know. I don't know why devout Christians you know, would read Harry Potter from beginning to end and not read the book of Hosea from beginning to end. I've been thoroughly engrossed in it. I'm not saying Christians read Harry Potter. Just, just flow with it, okay? The Hardy Boys, whatever. Okay? It's a problem. It's a big problem. So I'm here to, to show not... I am here to make what is complicated very simple. And to show you what you thought was simple is really quite complicated. Thank you for your question. Very good, very good. All right, we'll move on to the next caller. How much time do we have left? We're still good. We're about 25 minutes. A little less than a half hour. Okay, very good. All right, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hi, Rabbi. Hi, William. This is Nicholas Jacobowski. I'm calling from Reno, Nevada. Hey, Nick. Glad you made it through, bro. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, I was reading Zechariah 9 the other day. And it see, I don't remember the first paragraph. But uh, it seems to talk about an individual that will speak peace to the nations. Um, And the second part talks about um, a covenant of blood. um, Where, but but the first part talks about how you will not have, or the the individual who's 
speaking peace will not have a bow or arrow. But then later it goes on to say in the covenant that um, there will be a bow and arrow for Ephraim. Um, but I think it's about Syria. I'm not sure. I think, but uh, I think it's about uh, Syria. So is there any way you can tell me the context? Let me, let me help you out here. Let me help you out here. My sweet brother, thank you for calling in. I'll help you out. I thank know you, why this is scary, and this is really easy. It's all good. So, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 10, we are told that the Mashiach himself is going to remove war from the world. world the chariots of Ephraim will be cut off. The horses of war will be removed. This in contrast to the donkey that the Messiah comes in on, which is an animal of labor, not an animal of war. He will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, from river to the end of the earth. Okay, so this is very important. You find this similar idea conveyed really in almost every other messianic passage in Tanakh. Read the first five passages of Isaiah chapter 2. You'll find the same theme. Sheikh is there to, to teach, to give hoichacha to the nations, to speak, and they'll listen to him. That's all. And the result will be peace. The covenant that we find in verse 11 is not has nothing to do with war. The blood covenant is the blood of the bris milah, of the circumcision, and the blood that was sprinkled upon the Jewish people when they were at Mount Sinai, when they were receiving the Torah of Mount Sinai. It's not blood there. The covenant of blood in verse 11 has nothing to do with war. It's just the opposite. You're quite right. Blood, sh you're, you're assuming that blood shed is conveyed there, but the term in Zechariah 9.10 the very following verses, Gam at bidam brisechem. Dam brisechem means the blood of a covenant, not the blood of war. That's all. So it's you just it's a covenant of blood, not a not a, a blood shed as in the English language. It's really very simple. Very cool. And we thank you for your question. Okay, moving on. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. William and Rabbi. So I have a question. Hopefully it's not too complicated, but um, I was watching one of your previous shows that was dated December 14th, 2014. That's almost seven years ago. And there was a question asked about the, does the Tanakh really say that Jews can eat or non-Jews can eat unclean flesh? And the Rabbi made a comment that's very concerning to my wife and I. He said, if you refrain from eating pork as a Noahide, but you go into the butcher shop or you go into the grocery store and buy a non-kosher chicken or a non-kosher piece of meat that's been injected with blood to make it look uh, healthier and people buy it, you're denying the oral law and therefore you're going to war with God. And that's a really concern for us because uh, we live in a I, farming community. I didn't community understand you, so I, and I don't know if you're... If you if my hearing is going, or if you just you sound muffled, I said some seven years ago that what just really say with me that if a non Jew eat a non Jew eats non kosher meat. No, no, no. Uh, you said the comment was that if you're a Noahide, right, and you right. refrain from eating pork. Right. And and you want to keep that, and you don't want to eat shellfish and and that kind of thing. But you go into the grocery store and buy uh, non-kosher chicken or non-kosher meat. You're denying the oral law, and you're therefore going to war with God. Uh, you don't have to answer it today. Uh, you can take. I, a look I'm going to answer it right now. Okay. So you what happened? My wife and I. We, we live in a farm. Just stay with me. Stay with me. You could stay on the line. You have to. Just for a second, I never would say such a thing. It just you misunder you misunderstood me. A person who is not Jewish, who is not a, a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is welcome to keep kosher. Is welcome if he wants to, or she wants to. 
She can eat only kosher. And there are many B'nai Noach who would not eat pork and only would eat kosher meat and chicken. I know of many who do that. And there are many B'nai Noach who eat, um, who would not eat pork or shellfish, but they would eat chicken and red meat that's not slaughtered properly. I know pe- many people like that. That's a choice that they make, but they're not obligated to keep those commandments because those commandments were given only to the Jewish people. It's not that they're prohibited from keeping kosher. They can. They're welcome to do it, but it's voluntary. That's all. That's, I, I, I would never say that someone's going to war with God if a nochide keeps kosher. Now, I think maybe the context might have been with the Jew because of the Jew, no. right, Rabbi? No, no, no. It What's wasn't that, that if, a, if a Noahide kept kosher, if a Noahide did not eat pork. But on the other hand, he's not keeping kosher. He's not buying kosher meat. He's not buying kosher chicken. So he's kind of picking and choosing some commandments he keeps, some he does, he ignores. In essence, he's ignoring the oral law. And you made a comment, it's like the suggestion so of the Kairos. So let me that's... provide a context where I could have said that, but you would have to put in a modifier there. If a Noahide said that the Jews are commanded not to eat pork, but and or shellfish, but there's no commandment for a Jew to eat properly slaughtered meat. So then that person's at war with God. Follow? If the person says that that we only believe in because in Leviticus eleven there's no mention of slaughter. Now there is explicit mention of slaughter much later on in Deuteronomy chapter twelve, verse twenty one. So if I wasn't clear at the time, I don't remember what I said. But the only way I would say that is if someone said that there is no method of slaughter and a person can kill an animal any way they want and if it, there's no method of removing the blood and the per- and this was all invented later. Right. If a person says that, they are at war with God. That's all I would say. Cool. Okay? All right. All right, Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Hi, this is Phil from New Jersey. Will Shavua Tov. Rob, it's always an honor to speak with you. Welcome, Phil. Um, yesterday, we read in the weekly Parsha, I'm focusing, Rob, I'm just going to give you the context of my question and then and then the actual question. Um, Deuteronomy, Devarim, um, chapter 21, verse 23. I, I must tell you, Rob, I've read this over and over, over the years, and it just never resonated with me, but it did yesterday for whatever reason, and I wanted to just get your thoughts. Just for your viewers, it talks about a body being impaled on a stick or on a tree shall not remain upon the tree all night. You shall surely bury him the same day for that body that's impaled is an abomination unto the Lord. I looked at Rashi's comments, Rob, and it suggests that because we're created in the image of God, it's an abomination to have essentially a corpse on a stick. My question to you, Rab, is what the heck is really going on in this section, and isn't it axiomatic that if it's an affront to the Lord for a dead man to be on a stick, then it would also be to worship a dead man on a stick. I'll hang up and listen to your thoughts. Thank you for considering. Very good. Rabbi, you clear on that? Wow. Well, I guess he is. <laughs> I, I, that's an applause for that question. Hang up now and turn in for your answer. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't even think that's how you would end the question. I thought you were going somewhere else with it. Applause. That's the first time anyone ever asked that question. And something, obviously, I thought about a lot and hope for an opportunity like this. First, our context. The, the, this part of Deuteronomy is discussing Jewish law, courts, torts, and capital offenses. The Torah wants us to know that a body, a dead body, must be interred, must be buried very quickly, and even someone who is who receives capital punishment, which would be a very rare event, but it happened, that the body cannot be up even overnight. Now, and from there we see that the body must be buried very, very quickly. Right there. Why did the Torah use the most extreme situation? You would think that the body of a person who was so wicked that he received the death penalty, 
that maybe he would not deserve a proper burial. So if a person who was condemned, who was very wicked, who received the death penalty, his body can't wait overnight. So certainly a person who's not a criminal, personally a, a just person, has to be buried immediately. And that's where I thought you were going with this, but then you kind of snapped it at the end and went, does this mean that you can't worship a, a dead person on a stick? I like it. It works. I don't, I don't think this will be the verse I would use to conclude that. I would, I would more rapidly use passages in Tanakh that tell us that you that the dead cannot die for the sins of the wicked, that you can't have vicarious atonement. Because Deuteronomy chapter 21 is not discussing atonement in that passage. We're not talking about anyone being forgiven. So I wouldn't use that. I would point to a passage which you, a firm person, says every day, Psalm 147, verse 3, adam she'ain lo teshua. Put not your trust in princes or the son of man wherein there is no salvation. That's what I that's what I was that's what I would say. I would say, Blessed is the man who doesn't put his trust in men. That's what I would do. So I I I would say that. Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, is not uh, conveying that. It's conveying that you must bury a person right immediately and you can't leave a person's body out. And there's a rush to bury. And in fact, it's a very big mitzvah to bury someone as quickly as possible. Uh, but I would use pas- I would use the very passages in the Tanakh which convey don't put your trust in the Son of Man. There is no salvation in the Son of Man. And in fact, Anoichi, Anoichi, I, even I am the Lord, the Ein Milvade Moshia, and there is no Savior besides me. I would think that clearly conveys what you're seeking to convey. Thank you for that question. All right, moving on to the next caller. Call your loud on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? How are you doing, Rabbi? How are you doing? This is Brian from Massachusetts. Brian, welcome. Uh, my question is, thank you. My question is um, more so on generally the Noahide laws. Um, I guess more specifically to make it easier, just idolatry. Um, there have been like many, for example, as there are many religions today, and there have been many religions in ancient times. Are those groups still responsible, for example, for the Sin, for committing the sin of idolatry, even though they've never really been exposed to the Noahide laws? Can this, the rabbi touch upon the Noahide laws and just like, because I know that every human is created in the image of Hashem. So how would they, without even hearing these laws or knowing about them, how would they be responsible for committing these sins when they think that their religion or, or for example, maybe not idolatry, or when they think that <clears throat> killing is like okay and, you know, decent. That's all. So based on that idea, so to know sin, and I mean, to know what is good and not do it is sin. So if they don't think it's actually wrong, is it sin? Yeah, around that. or it's And more so, like, if they've never even heard of the, these Noahide laws. Okay. Then, like, yeah. Good question. Rabbi? Atheists, I've heard argue and state that to theists that if you didn't believe in God anymore, would you go out and murder somebody? I've heard that. I've heard that stated by atheists. A claim, an argument made. And I find it just a fabulous question. So atheists have to confront a very serious problem. That is that if the world is completely materialistic, just we're just bags of meat, we're walking protoplasm, we're just carbon and hydrogen, then where are you get your morals from? It means 
these terms like right and wrong and good and evil, they don't make sense in a completely materialistic world. And they have to address that. How, then what is your source for evil? What is, I understand why you don't want people killing each other, but is there an, an empirical good and evil in the world if you're, you deny the existence of God, that this, there is no God, there's nothing? This is a serious issue which people who deny HaKadosh Baruch Hu have to contend with. Is, is What's wrong with them with raping and killing babies? I mean, there's this... Okay. So I have heard frequently atheists make the argument. They never made it to me, but I've watched it. Where they'll make the argument in the following way. When speaking to a theist, they would ask the question, if you didn't believe in God, would you go out and just start murdering people? And that question seems clever because I, I think people would go, no, I wouldn't. And the question is why? But in fact, as it turns out, they're answering the question. They're making the problem even stronger because the reason, in fact, why people, if they chas v'chalila, didn't believe in God anymore, would not go out and stop murdering, is because they're created in the image of God. Because every person, theist or atheist, is created in the image of Hashem. And therefore, we are Bluetooth, we are wired, hardwired for the seven Noahide laws. We are hardwired not to murder. And if you try to convey to a cat, let's say you could speak to a cat. Let's say you could speak cat. And you would say to a cat, which is a, an animal that must kill in order to live, that it's wrong to murder. It's not that the cat would disagree with you. The cat wouldn't even know what you're talking about. If you told, you could speak to any other animal and said it's wrong to kill, they would look at, it's not that they would disagree, but the animal wouldn't even know what you're talking about. Why? Because your cat, as much as you love your dog and your cat, they are not created by Selim Elohim. They're not created in the image of Hashem. They have no neshama inside of them. And therefore, they have no, they would, killing for them is fine. It's not a problem at all. Some of the most dangerous predators and most successful predators in the world are, in fact, the wild dogs that, in, that are in the African continent, in, in the Australian continent, and almost nothing could stand up to a pack of these dogs that will just rip animals to pieces. These are the dogs you love. So as it turns out, the reason why we would not go out and murder is because we know empirically that there's something wrong with it. And when people, in fact, do go out and murder and, and just, I'm not talking O.J. Simpson, we could go, a guy's jealous, but why would you do that? But people just go out and just start serial killers. We know they're crazy in a way because they are, they're, they're sociopaths. They have no ability to empathize with another person's pain. They are broken people. There's a disorder going on there. So, in fact, people are created in the image of Hashem, and therefore we know, because we are hardwired for this, that murder is wrong. And the only thing a Ben Noach must do is he must ascribe it to God. And as it turns out, the vast majority of the world's population, the vast majority of people on the universe believe in God, believe in some sort of higher power. And the numbers are astounding. It's somewhere in the upper areas of maybe 95% of the world's population believe in some sort of higher power. So therefore, in fact, the Noahide law is now getting back what was conveyed, al pi Kabbalah, which means it was transmitted from Adam Harishon, Adam, the first man who conveyed this bin Nevoah in prophecy, Noah, who is the father of every person alive today. Every human being is a descendant of Noah, of eight people who survived the flood. 
and he was a prophet and conveyed these teachings. And we see the, in case you wonder, like, where is it? Well, you could find where murder is really, really wrong at the first murder in the Bible, in Genesis chapter 4. You could see that behaving in a way that is illicit, you could see it right away in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. For example, there are many other places. We could see that sleeping with another man's wife very early on in Genesis 13 and 20, they all knew it was wrong. In fact, when Abraham had to say that Sarah was his sister rather than his wife, it's because we, this is not even an inference. Explicitly, they, Avimelech would have known that he, he, he can't take a man's wife. Now, he was not a good guy. He might have killed him you know, to eliminate the husband, but that means that they knew very well that adultery was wrong. They knew it very, very well. And Avimelech responded very well in Genesis chapter 20 when God told him directly, get her out of the palace, get her out. So the seven Noahide laws were known to mankind from the time that God created Adam Rishon, and it continued that way, and we are hardwired for that. We, we know empirically that it's wrong to murder, and in fact, in murder, in fact, almost all, any religion I can think of holds that it's murder is wrong. The question is, is, is some religions, unfortunately, teach you can kill. And then there's one religion that says, well, it's not the only one, but that 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 the ritual murder and then followed by ritual cannibalism is, in fact, the best thing in the world. And that's Christianity, which teaches that. But it is wrong to think that the Nochai laws were only known to the world at Mount Sinai. Now, at Mount Sinai, when the Jewish people received the Torah, it then became they now had it written, and that's why there are Nochites that pay special attention to the festival of Shavuot more than any other holiday because then what was until then passed down through tradition from generation to generation was then put into writing, which is a very important to a Noachite as well. But it is wrong to say that people did not know it was wrong to murder. And that's the reason why if you that's the reason why atheists behave, in, and I'm going to make a generality, atheists, what's really going on here is atheists, I, presumably the atheists you meet in the United States, are behaving as though there is a God, even though they're saying there is no God. It means atheists get that it's wrong to murder. I'm going to presume that. And they feel that it's wrong to murder because they Although they have ignored, they have, they turn their back on the Torah, which is very, very tragic, and I hope they repent. But they are creating the image of Hashem, and therefore, don't want to murder and don't want to commit these crimes. And the reason is because they created B'tselam Elokim. They know it empirically, and there has never been another animal ever that believed in God and that thought that murder was was wrong, was evil. Never, never existed. Only man is created hardwired for belief in God. Thank you for that question. Excellent show, Rabbi. Lots of great questions today, as usual. And um, so look forward to seeing you next week. Hashem willing, Rabbi. And hope you get plenty of rest from all your ventures here in the in the States and your travels. And get your, your mind clock back in order with Israel. <laughs> So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, once again, OutreachJudaism.org. If you don't have the two-volume book set, you are missing out. Also, the audio files, in case you tuned in late, uh, OutreachJudaism.org, free audio tab at the top. It is not the same information, so you're getting two sets of different information. So be sure to order up. Uh, so you guys have a great week. And Rabbi, love you much, and we'll see you soon on the other side. Take care, everybody. Shavuot Peace out. <laughs>